Today's sermon is entitled, Strength and Weakness. Samson. My name is Reverend Derek Gelder. I'm a senior pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say a special thank you for taking time at your busy schedule. You know what? Here in New Brunswick, it was a beautiful day out. I, I got a chance to go on a road trip, and I just got back just a little while ago, and I must say, God is good. Oh, he is so good to give us such a beautiful day outside. So I hope and pray you've enjoyed the outdoor weather, and now you're just sitting down to a tea or a coffee, and you're saying, you know, I want to hear about God. I hope, I hope you're in that mind frame. Because I want to tell you a wonderful and beautiful story about Samson. It's taken from Judges chapter number 15, verses 1 to 20. Whom amongst us really hasn't heard of the story of Samson? You know, I remember I, I was um, in one of my classes at seminary um, many a few years ago. And I remember that in that class, the professor made a statement. He said, you know what? Yes, you know, we're living in a time, in a day and an age where people don't really love God as much as they used to. It seems like here in North America, fewer and fewer people actually know God. But he said, also, it's a wonderful and beautiful time, even though that's very negative that people don't know God. It's a beautiful time, though, to introduce this society to stories from the Bible. And I think it is. I can't assume that everybody who listens to this sermon knows everything about Samson. So I want to tell you the story about Samson for those who don't know it, but I also want to tell the story to all of you who do know the story about Samson, but I want you to make sure that you get the message, because I think there's some lessons. There's going to be three of them that I'm going to focus on today that I really want you to get. But first, I want you to think about Samson. What was he known for? Strength. Absolutely. He was known for his strength. Can you imagine slaying 1,000 Philistines with nothing but a a jawbone of a donkey? 1,000 Philistines by himself with the jawbone of a donkey. That's incredible. That's that's mind-boggling that he had that much strength. Can you imagine somebody approaching a lion? I don't want you, but when I look at the TV or if I go to a zoo and actually meet a lion, you know, kind of face to face, so to speak, they're ferocious animals. They're huge. And you can see the power in their legs and you can see in their jaws and those really big teeth. You can see they're ferocious. And Samson, it says in scriptures, with his bare hands, tore one apart when it, when it came near him. So, you know, he had incredible strength. And then, of course, as you can see in the picture, the way that Samson dies is that he's in the middle of a temple and he pushes on both the pillars of the temple and the whole entire structure comes down. That is strength. Now, think about this for a moment. What would happen? Tomorrow morning, you get up. You get out of bed. Now, I don't know about you, as you get a little bit older, you get a few more creaks, you get a few more groans in your body, and this morning you wake up and you feel fantastic. You feel great. I mean, you're excited and you, you, you feel muscles that you haven't felt in years, and you feel stronger than you ever have. You can't believe it. And you get up and you find out that you have the strength of a thousand men, and that you are powerful and you are strong, and God has called you to be a judge. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't wouldn't you be excited about that? And then God says, oh, by the way, you're going to be my instrument and I'm going to work in and through you to free the people of Israel or at least to begin that process of them throwing off the yoke of the Philistine, a powerful enemy at that time of Israel. Would you not be excited? I know I certainly would be. And I know Samson probably was too as well. It must have been a huge honor to be chosen for that kind of role. And I think while it is very tempting to put Samson on a pedestal, and it certainly is, um, and put us on a very small pedestal with our ministry roles, we've got to be very careful in doing that. Because Samson wasn't chosen because he was God-fearing, that he was in tune with God, that he walked and talked with God every single day. He wasn't chosen because of his virtue. He was chosen because he was weak. That's a funny thing to say, isn't it, about Samson? Samson actually was spiritually weak. He had great physical strength, but not spiritual strength. And as we go through this sermon, we're going to find out that he sinned a lot. And God still chose to use him inside of his kingdom. And that's the wonderful thing. So if you don't get anything else from this sermon, please pay attention to that. Yes, sometimes we sin. And yes, sometimes we fall short of God's glory. 
And I want to say God does want us to confess our sins. He wants us to make it right. I don't want to belittle that process because that's incredibly important. But when we do sin and fall short of God's glory, and, and we're the kind of people, and I know I am from time to time, I sin quite a bit, and I have to ask for a confession, that doesn't mean that you're disqualified from God's kingdom. That doesn't mean that he's going to get you to no longer serve. No, God wants you to serve with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And God actually uses or works through, better yet, the weakest of us and does the greatest things in his kingdom because that's the way he wants to operate. He wants people to see his presence in this world. And the best way that is done is through having servants that are weak. And I think that's important. But let me talk about three sins, three really big sins that demonstrate that Samson was really spiritually weak in God's sight. Number one, and I think this is really important, especially to today's day and age, there's a big danger in, in basically going after a mate who's a non-Christian. There's a huge danger in being what the scripture calls unequally yoked. That's number one. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Number two, there's a huge danger in seeking vengeance in order to try to get justice because most times that leads to more vengeance, not justice. And number three, there's a big danger and a huge sin in when God delivers us not to give him credit, but to take the credit for ourselves. And when we get in trials and tribulations to forget all the times that God has saved us. So three really big sins. But now a professor told me, you know what? We live in a day and age where a lot of people don't know about Samson. I think he's right. I told you that at the beginning of this sermon. I think it is really true. So I want to tell you a little bit about Samson just in case you're sitting there and you're having your coffee and you're saying to yourself, I don't really know much about Samson. Let me give you just a, a biography, a very quick one though. I want to say first and foremost, Samson, his name was Semis and it meant little son. Most likely he lived at the end of the 11th century B.C. His father was Manoah. He was from the tribe of Dan, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. While his mother's name is not known, like her predecessor, Sarah, she received a divine visitor. Now, she was barren. And as far as she knew, well, she was probably thinking her and her husband were praying to God a lot, asking, come on, we really need to have a child. We want to have a, a child of our own. And finally, God said yes to them. You can imagine their excitement. But God said, oh, by the way, he's to be set out separate and distinct. He is to be raised as what is called back then a Nazarite. And the Nazarites had particular rules. And I'm just going to give you a couple of those rules that are just a little bit more odd than your average one. Obviously, a Nazarite would have to love God and serve God and follow God's commands and laws, of course. But there were some other rules that were a little bit more strange. Number one, the Nazarite would have to not drink any wine. That'd be a little bit strange during that time period. Number two, they could not cut their hair. Again, a little bit odd. And number three, no contact with the dead. So a little bit different rules than maybe some of the other people of the nations around them would have. Number six, one to 21. 1,200 years after the conquest, the Philistine and the Amorites actually went up to the tribe of Dan. And they started harassing them and they started, you know, moving towards them and threatening them. Part of the tribe of Dan, in response to all those threats, migrated elsewhere. The other part of the tribe of Dan decided they would accept the rule of the Philistines. In other words, you know what? We'll pay you whatever tribute you want as long as you let us live in peace. We'll pay your taxes, so to speak, and everybody will get along. Samson was chosen by God to be one of the last judges during a time period in which spiritual confusion was real. Uh, moral depravity existed all throughout Israel. And political fragmentation was a reality, and it was predominant amongst God's people. Despite having been chosen as a judge and blessed with supernatural strength, Samson actually had a lot of sins. And one of the sins that he wrestled with the most was the fact that he wanted to have um, his mates that he was looking for, his, his companions, so to speak, was always a foreigner. It was, and according to scripture, it was not supposed to be a foreigner, but Samson chose a foreigner anyway. And as a result of that, of course, he sinned gravely against God. Samson himself, he would have been known forever for his strength, but ultimately he was not known as a person, a judge who would bring the people together and rule them. He wasn't known for his rulership or his organization of his people, but he was known as an individualistic hero who had spent a lot of time focusing on himself 
rather than on God. And rarely did he ever give God credit for the miracles that God actually did in his life. But I want to say this, and we want to get this now. I want you to take this very important fact with you. And that is God, despite Samson's sins, actually worked in and through his life. And Samson did great and wonderful things as one of Israel's judges. So we've got to keep that in mind because God does want to work in through you and me, despite our sins in life too. Now, I want to start with act number one. Now, this scripture, Judges chapter 15, is broken into three acts. Three different sins that I want to highlight that Samson worked through, and I want us to work through it a little bit to, because it really relates to our uh, culture today. So, act number one. Act number one took place during, time, during the time of the uh, wheat season. That would have been probably about this time of year. And Samson had taken a goat, and he took it as a present to his, his wife, and he was, um, which was customary because he was a, he was a, he had a visiting marriage. Now let me explain what that really means. Uh, back then, you could get married, and when you got married, you could say, "I want my wife to live with her family. I'm not actually going to live with her. I'm going to live somewhere else." But I'm going to visit from time to time and see my wife, have relations with her, and I'm going to spend time with her and her family, and then I'm going to go back to wherever else I actually live. It was customary. It's not a practice we do today, of course. It's a little bit odd and strange for us, but it was customary in Samson's time. Now, Samson got in a little bit of trouble when he decided that uh, he was going to get married. And when he got married he gave this riddle out to the Philistines. And he liked to taunt the Philistines a lot. And so he gives them this riddle. And he basically gives it to me. He says, you know what? If you can get my riddle right, then I will give you some wealth. If you can't get this riddle right, then you'll give me some wealth. And it was some clothing. But it was a big thing for them back then. So anyway, the Philistines tried and tried and tried to guess what the answer to his riddle was. And they couldn't get it. And they tried some more and they got frustrated. So they went to his wife privately, of course, with Samson not there, and said to his wife, you know what, Samson, can you get Samson to say what the answer to the riddle is to you? So the wife started begging Samson, will you tell me the answer to the riddle? And she kept begging and begging and begging until finally Samson said, yes, I will tell you the answer to the riddle if, if that just keeps you quiet. Yes, anything, you know, she really grated on his nerves. So he finally gave her the answer to the riddle, and to his dismay, she immediately went to the Philistines, betrayed her husband's trust, and told them the answer to the riddle. Samson came good on the bat and actually gave the wealth that he said he would. He gave the clothing that he said he would give them. And, but then he wasn't very happy. So he actually left her, which was normal. You know, during the marriage, he was a little huffy puffy, but he actually left, left her at her dad's house, which would have been normal, and went back home again. After a while, he calmed down. He decided, you know what? I'm going to go back. So he goes back with a present, which was customary. And he basically wants to reconcile with his wife. And he wants to consummate the marriage. Because apparently he hadn't done that yet. And he arrives there. And the dad looks at him and says, you know what? When Samson says, can I go in and see your daughter, my wife? I want to have relations with her, consummate the marriage, and make this permanent. The dad says, no, I, I can't let you do that. I've given your wife away to somebody else. And you could only imagine the horror on his face. And he's thinking, wait a minute, how's this right? How's this fair? And he says, I don't like this at all. And of course, he's starting to get a little bit angry, a little bit huffy. And remember, Samson's got a lot of strength now. So you don't want this big man getting mad at you. So the dad says, you know what? I'll make you a deal. I will give you my uh, younger daughter. And she's far more attractive than uh, your previous wife or your wife that was supposed to be. I'll give you her and you can get married to her and all things will be right. Well, Samson doesn't like that idea, and he says, no, I wanted the other one. That's the one I fell in love with. I don't want the younger daughter. I want this to be made right. The father says it's not going to happen. So he decides, you know what, Samson, his mind says, I think the Philistines put the father up to this, most likely. I think they have. I'm going to go punish them for it. So he goes out, and he catches 100 foxes, or I think they were actually jackals. Most uh, commentaries agree with that. They were jackals, and the jackals actually traveled in packs, and he caught, I don't know how he did it, but with his bare hands, he caught a hundred of them. And then he took them and he tied their tails together, as you can see in this picture. And he tied a torch to their tails. And it was at nighttime. And he lit the torch on fire and he let them go in the grain of the Philistines' fields. 
And of course, you can only imagine this is during the wheat season. All the grain has already been, you know, harvested. It's all sitting in the field, drying up. It's very combustible. And the second the foxes go through there or the the, uh, jackals, the second the jackals go through there, it lights them all on fire and the Philistines lose all of their crops. To say they were angry would be an understatement. They were not very happy because in the end, it burned absolutely everything, the grapevines, the olive trees, all of the grain, and in an agricultural economy, that would have devastated them, absolutely devastated them. So they're sitting back, and the Philistines now are not impressed. Now, I want to stop at the story right there, and we're going to get to Act number two in a minute. But first, before I get there, I want to focus on Samson and his choice of women. Now, Samson wasn't very good at necessarily choosing the right women. He tended to choose those individuals that he ought not to. He was told very clearly in scriptures that he was not supposed to be unequally yoked. Now, you see the picture here, and I like this picture. One's of a donkey, one's of the ox. I'll let you decide who's the donkey and who's the ox. I don't know which one is which, but that doesn't matter. In the end, what scripture said is that if you see a believer then yes, you can get married to a believer. If you have a non-Christian that you meet, you should not get married to them. That's what Scripture had told Samson. Well, Samson goes back and he says, you know what, I want to get married. I want to get married to a foreigner, which was even worse because Scripture said you're not supposed to marry foreigners, but I want, to get mar- I want to get married to a foreigner, he tells his mom and dad, who is not a believer, who believes in foreign gods. And of course, his mom and dad try to talk him out of it, but he says, no, I want you to arrange a marriage anyway. And, of course, he ends up getting married to her. You know, I think there is a lot to be said about this. I think it's absolutely hideous, first and foremost, that he killed the animals. Let me focus on that first before I get back to this marriage situation. I think it's wrong. Definitely wrong. And I'm going to tell you why. I think that cruelty to animals, according to Scripture, is not okay. There was a time when we lived in the Garden of Eden, as Adam and Eve did, at as they did, I should say. We didn't live there, but Adam and Eve did. And they lived there in harmony. They lived there with the animals. The animals didn't eat each other, and we didn't eat the animals. There will come a time, way in the distant future, which that situation will be the same. We will be, the Garden of Eden will be restored, and we will not eat the animals, and we certainly will not um, be cruel to them in any way, shape, or form. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a vegetarian. I'm certainly not a vegetarian. I do believe it's okay in eating animals because Scripture says so. But I do believe it's wrong to be cruel to them. So I want to say, first and foremost, I think in my mind, Samson definitely sinned when he was cruel to the animals. But he also sinned by taking on a foreign wife. And we find out in uh, that Samson later on would take on another wife uh, and have relations with her, a prostitute named Delilah. And in the end, Delilah would lead to his downfall. And Delilah basically, um, the Philistines talked her into it, said, you know what, you need to go get Samson, make sure that you put on the charm with him, make sure that he falls madly in love with you. And then what I want you to do is work on him day in and day out and find out what gives him his strength. And we know the story that that's exactly what happened day in and day out. They, she worked on Samson until finally Samson broke down and said, if you cut my hair, of course I'll lose my strength. And that's what happened. She cut his hair when he was sleeping. He lost his strength. And then the Philistines came, gouged out his eyes and took him to the temple and the foreign god, their foreign god's temple. And then, of course, they poked fun and mimicked him. And then he prayed to God. He said, God, give me strength one more time. And he pushed on the pillars and everything came down and he killed all the Philistines. Now, Let me go back to the part where it's wrong to take on a foreign wife. It's wrong to take on an unbelieving wife. And we find that true in 2 Corinthians 6. uh, And if you look at verses 4 to 18, we should not be taking on a foreign wife or an unbeliever, not a foreign wife, I should say, but an unbeliever because they have a, a devotion to the world. They are in love with this world. They're in love with the ways of this world. They're on the narrow path that leads to destruction, according to Scripture. And Scripture says, what does light have to do with darkness? If we're going to take on a spouse, that spouse should be a believer and love God like we love God. So that our focus will not be split between pleasing our mate and pleasing God, but we can actually please God and please our mate at the same time. 
So that's the first thing I want to say, especially in this day and age. I want to say, make sure if you're a young person, make sure you choose somebody who actually believes in God like you do so that both of you can grow in the faith together and help each other out. Don't pick a non-believer because then you're not going to be able to grow in the faith by helping each other out at all. Your unbelieving spouse will actually pull you away from God. So that's the first thing I want to say for the sin that Samson did. Let's go on to act number two. Act number two is an act of vengeance. And we have heard all about this idea of eye for eye retribution. Even though Samson's uh, claimed innocence and presumed right to seek vengeance in the face of subtlety and malice was maybe, you could say, justifiable in some way. I think that ultimately he felt that he was justified to go out and burn this, the Philistines' field. He really wasn't. He really should not have done it. Vengeance never leads to a good outcome. As soon as the Philistines found out what Samson actually did, he went out and burned all their fields and ruined their economy. They got extremely bitter at him, but they wondered, what are we going to do with him? He's strong, and they knew that. He knew that he could overpower them, so they decided to take the coward's way out, and they went to Samson's uh, wife, her home, or I guess his, his former wife, or the wife that he wanted to have, and the dad, and burned the, the whole place down with them in it. And, of course, that was not good. And as a result of that, Samson burned with absolute utter contempt. He was motivated with personal revenge. And he went out and he went across the landscape and he said, I'm going to keep killing as many of the Philistines as I possibly can until I feel like I have done exactly what they did to me. And he sought the vengeance with, with absolute um, um, fervency. And he said, I'm not going to stop until I get my pound of flesh, in other words. And he basically went out and he said, I'm going to get it. Seeing that continued domination and peace with the rulers of the Philistines was in jeopardy. Ultimately, the, um, the people said, you know what, we've got to do something about Samson. Because then, then the people said, you know what, Samson has angered the Philistines. And they said, we're going to have to do something about this situation. So the Philistines, they sent uh, 3,000 men and they camped right near the tribe of Dan. They weren't that far away from them. And that scared the tribe of Dan. And the tribe of Dan said, you know what? We're going to go down and we're going to meet Samson. And they did. They sent 3,000 men to go see Samson and said, you know what? We're going to have to bind you with ropes. And we're going to have to hand you over to the Philistines because we don't want a war with them. They were just too scared of the Philistines. They could have rallied and they should have rallied with Samson and said, let's go fight. Let's get our freedom. But he said, no. We're not going to do that. We're just going to hand you our, our nationalistic hero, the one that God's chosen to be our judge. We're going to hand you over to the enemy for uh, what they thought would have been a certain death. You know, I think from act number two, we learned a lot about vengeance. I think vengeance is the Lord's. I think vengeance always should be the Lord. From act number two, we find out rarely does vengeance ever lead to justice, but merely hurts the pride and traps the recipient in a never-ending cycle of violence. Even though Samson's retribution fulfilled its higher calling to weaken the Philistines, this did not justify his selfish motives to appease his wrath and satisfy his pride. While any act of violence can be justified with an eye you know, for an eye mentality, rarely do these acts of violence lead to justice because we don't see so clearly through the planks of our own sin. I have met people inside of church conflict that would sit back and say, well, I only did unto them what they did to me. And because they attacked me, I, I was just defending myself and I went after them. But when you look at the real picture of what's happened in these churches with this kind of conflict that occurs, you find out, hey, wait a minute now, you did a lot of sin. You actually precipitated a lot of this battle. And the people who came back and they did a battle against you, they had a lot of sin in their heart too. And you find out neither one of them was actually innocent at all. I think ultimately we're not very good judges of other people's motives. We can't see into their hearts and we can't understand why they do the things they do. We should really leave all judging up to God, who is the judge of both the living and the dead. 2 Timothy 4.1 When it comes to our attitude towards our perpetrators of life, are we not instructed to avoid doing evil against those who do evil against us? Are we not instructed as Christians to do good unto them? And, and it says in scriptures, that is the way we show our love towards them. 
I met a fellow that um, he did cause a fight with inside of the church. I met another lady who caused a fight inside of the church. I met several people that I've read that have caused fights in the church. And I got thinking, why don't you do good unto those people that you meet that do cause fights? Why don't you show them God's love and see if you can break through and tell them all about Jesus? And I think we miss out on that. And while the world thinks that this kind of attitude that we have of doing good unto those who harm us is a sign of weakness, I think it's actually a sign ultimately of strength because it shows that we trust our Creator enough that we let Him judge and Him decide who's right and who's wrong. I can tell you in conflict, that's not easy. When churches have conflict and when they fight with one another inside of the church, it's not easy to sit back and say, you know what? I'm going to let God judge and God decide who is right and wrong. It's not easy to do that, but that's what God wants us to do. And he actually wants us to do good unto one another. So from from Samson's life, we learn a wrong does not make a right. It never does. Let God be the judge. We learn that to be very true. And I think the third thing that I want to focus on is the power of forgetting about God. What does that do for us? You know, it has a tremendous impact upon us. It can have a a devastating effect, but it does have power over us when we forget that God is good in all the things he's done for us. The final acts of Judges, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson. So they tied him up, and and because the um, his own people are absolutely petrified of the Philistines and they want to keep the status quo, they want them to be their rulers, so to speak. Um, they tie up Samson and they hand him over to the Philistines. And the Philistines are, as they're receiving Samson, they're singing songs and they're saying, "Oh my!" To their gods, they're saying, "This is great! What a great victory we have!" Um, the Spirit of God comes powerfully over Samson. And it says that the uh, ropes that he's tied with, they, they become like brittle and they fall off. And they say, Samson gives us incredible power and strength. And he takes, as you can see in the picture, a jawbone of a donkey, a fresh jawbone. And he takes that and he slays a thousand Philistines. You know, he shows God's might and power. And he makes it very clear. Not, and, and here's the thing about this. The Spirit of God was strong. And Samson was able to, despite his weakness, despite his sin that I've already talked about, and some more sin that I'm going to talk about here in a moment, he was able to actually do God's bidding. For though Samson displayed absolutely little concern whatsoever for the fate of God's people, the victory was God's. And God's might would be shown, even though Samson was physically strong, spiritually weak, God still showed that he was in charge of the situation. God granted Samson the right or the privilege of ultimately showing that strength. Um, Right after the uh, victory had occurred, we find out that Samson is very thirsty. So he he says, he cries out to God and he says, God, I'm so thirsty and I'm going to die of thirst, God, if you don't do something. And we find out that the end result of that is that Samson um, cries out a little bit more and God says, okay, I will grant you some water and gives him this hole, makes this hole filled with water and Samson gets water and his thirst is quenched. Um, And I want to talk about this because this is a sin. Samson doesn't say thank you to God. He doesn't say, thank you, Lord, you gave me this wonderful and beautiful victory. He doesn't say, Lord, you're so awesome and you're so mighty and you're so prevalent and you're so just, you're a beautiful God. Look what you just did for your people. Instead, all he could think about is himself. Lord, you know what? Uh, Give me some strength here, Lord, so that I can break free of these ropes or the Philistines are going to kill me. He should have prayed, Lord, give me this strength, Lord, that I need in order for your might and your power to be demonstrated so the Philistines might know that you're powerful. He didn't say that. He didn't say, may I smite the enemy in order to, or for my people to know that you still love them. He didn't say that either. And when it came to his thirst, he didn't say, you know what, give me some water so that I might get my strength back, so I might you know, go after these Philistines and make sure they leave your people alone. He didn't say that. He said, you know what, selfishly, Lord, give me some more might so I might not die. Samson was not an individual who looked at the people at all. From this final act, I think we learn how casually 
we Christians can be overwhelmed when it comes to our trials and tribulations. Why would one who had been granted with the power to slay 1,000 men with a mere jawbone of a donkey ever think God would let him die from thirst? Charles Spurgeon read uh, Judges chapter number 15 and concluded, It was very usual for God's people when they have enjoyed a great deliverance to find a little trouble too much for them to handle. Apostle James says that trials and tribulations in life help us to mature in the faith when we persevere. We need to seek wisdom and never waver in our belief or God will not give us that wisdom. Our belief must be that God is sovereign, in other words. And Samson, he didn't seem to demonstrate that belief in God at all. He didn't give God the credit and the honor for his victory like he should have. Instead, he whined to God and said, you know what, I'm about to perish. His focus was on himself, in other words, and not on the people of God and certainly not on God himself. Whether afflictions happen by chance in our lives or whether they are of our own doing, you know, we've got to understand that when we go through these trials and tribulations, we've got to look at our lives and say, God will help me. God will help me make it through it. Either he will help me persevere through trials and tribulations or he's going to help me come out the other side of those trials and tribulations. You know, I think that trials and tribulations often can be a catalyst to bring us to our knees and say, Lord, I need you. And I think that's a catalyst sometimes that we need. Instead of murmuring in the dark deserts of life, one is to, to count one's blessings, to remember all the times God has saved you in your life. And I know he saved me lots of time in my life. And we're supposed to say, Lord, please help me, Lord God. Please help me to be grateful. And please help me have faith in you because you will help me be strong despite the fact that right at this moment, I am incredibly weak. You know, I think there's a lot of lessons here to be known. So when you feel overwhelmed by life's biggest challenges and the greatest difficulties, remember this. Those who rely on God will find in their weakness moments moments of life that they are truly the strongest if and only if they choose to rely on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. If they don't, then of course they're going to be weak. So I want you to remember Samson this way. Remember, yes, he was physically strong, but he was also spiritually weak. We should not put him on, on a, a too far down because he was a judge of God. And he, was, he was a great man of God. But at the same time, we shouldn't put him on too high of a pedestal because his spiritual walk was not strong. It was not one that, was, was, that we would expect from a judge. He was actually fairly weak. That means that God can use you and me inside of his kingdom. And I think he does. And despite our sin and despite our weaknesses, God still chooses us to be his hands and feet. And praise be to God for that. Because if he didn't choose us, sinners saved by grace through faith, to be his hands and feet, well, he'd have to do it himself. And I know he could. But isn't it a miracle in great grace and great mercy that he chooses us to serve? And I think it's wonderful. I hope and pray that you have an absolutely beautiful day. It's still a sunny day out there for me. So I'm going to go out in the sun. But I hope and pray that you are enjoying that sun and that you're just enjoying your walk with God. And remember, he always forgives us when we sin, when we ask. So if you're having a moment of weakness and you're having a lot of sin in your life right now and you're saying, Pastor, I don't know if God would ever use me again. Get on your hands and knees, please do. And I just beg of you, get on your hands and knees and ask God to forgive you. And he is right and he's, he's, he's just. He will forgive you. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. And then ask him, Lord, would you just let me run in your kingdom? Would you let me serve in your kingdom, Lord? And he will. Praise be to God for that. May God bless you on this wonderful and beautiful day. Amen.